All right, so everyone's had a little bit of time to have a bit of a chat and meet each other and perhaps talk about what some of their, you know, pre preconceptions are about the process and so forth. So today what I wanna cover off is just some background information about why certify? Why have we actually gone down this path? Um, it has a path that started in 2007. So it's been coming for seven years. Um, and there's been a long, long, long gestational period and consultation and so forth. So let's have a look at, you know, what, is, what are the drivers behind certification? We'll also talk about the body of knowledge and I agree wholeheartedly with Dave. One of the things that strikes me more and more and more is the body of knowledge is one of the most amazing pieces of work ever done in safety and hardly anybody knows about it. It's, you know, and it's incredible source of information. And I think the Institute, um, or I know that the Institute, you know, needs to let people know and say, this is the kind of thing that the Institute does for the profession. We actually have facilitated uh, the process so that it could actually happen. The Institute provided the corporate structure through which the project could run, um, has provided significant amount of resource in terms of, you know, in-kind support, office support, um, all of those things to actually enable the project to happen whilst the content of the project has been put together independently by experts and so forth. So it's not an in-house thing that's been developed by SIA people. But, you know, quite frankly, the SIA has ste really stepped up to the plate to make it happen. And I think sometimes when people say to me, well, what can the Institute do for me? That is an ex a, a, a great example of exactly what a professional body needs to be doing. Um, and it is a significant piece of work that has international credibility. So I encourage you, I know it's a big thing, but I encourage you to even just go and have a look at the table of contents of what's in there. It's, it's, it's really interesting. Um, we're going to have a little break. Then we'll talk about the process. How do you get certified? Um, and then we'll have a bit of a discussion towards the end just about any remaining issues. I want to make the point though, this is a starting point. This is not an ending point. There is no point at which we'll go, you know, if you're not certified by X date, it's all over. Essentially, we are kicking off and saying, now starts the process for people to say, do I want to be certified? It's voluntary. And if I want to be certified, when might I look at doing that? So you might say, okay, I don't want to be certified in the next year. So I'm going to start working towards that. I don't want people to be, feel fearful that there's suddenly some date that's going to come crashing down by which, oh, I have to get it done by. All right, so if we're looking at, you know, why certify? There are a range of issues that have been coming forward about, you know, why certification is needed of safety professionals. Um, these were identified from employers, um, from the regulators, you know, there were issues where the regulators would go out, inspectors would issue notices, you know, recommend for an employer to get advice from a safety professional and then come back and realise, well, that advice was, you know, not, not very adequate or it was so varied, you know, there was difficulty. So there was, such a, there was a varied competence in the profession, the good, the bad and the ugly. A lack of clarity of knowledge of what's required for a generalist role. What is a safety professional? I mean, years ago, and actually not that long ago, it was perhaps the person who was away on the day that they decided who the safety officer was. You know, or it could be the payroll girl who's good with forms and things. Or it could be a really, really highly qualified or a full-time person. There was such a variation across what is a safety professional and what is a generalist role? And I actually think one of the best things that come out, that's come out of this project is a real crystallising. What is that role? And it is a real role, it has a real place, and it now has a framework within to sit. So people can say, in high school, I want to be a, safety, a generalist safety professional when I leave school and actually work towards that. Um, so it ha it's, it's crystallised exactly you know, what that is. There was inconsistent levels of education. The level, the content, and the delivery was very is, is is still very inconsistent. And Dave alluded to that. The accreditation board is a, is a huge step forward in terms of getting tertiary education on the same playing field, accrediting courses and accrediting institutions to deliver it. But there, as we know, there is a whole vet sector and there's a whole um, RTO sector out there that is extremely varied. You can Google IHS diploma. And I think there's like a five day one in Bali, if you want to go there. 
um, you know, there's one day a month for three months or there's, you know, full time for six weeks. Some cost 500 bucks, some cost $3,000. It's all over the shop as to what, uh, you know, and, and what you'll actually receive in terms of content. Um, there are unqualified and inexperienced people working without supervision. As I said, you know, there are still people being put in safety roles because the workplace says, I must say, significantly less, but in my time in working in safety, um, you know, you would work, roll up to a workplace and there would be the payroll lady. Oh, she's looking after safety for us. Um, and the thing I found often in my working with those people is they were often in a state of real high anxiety because they knew they didn't know what they were doing. They were very concerned about what would happen to them if an incident occurred. They were very anxious about, I don't, I, I don't know if I'm giving the right advice and I'm not being given any support in terms of, you know, the, the advice that I am giving. giving. Um, so they were often very, very stressed out people. Um, a lack of selection criteria for consumers. So when an employer said, I want a safety professional, well, how do I go about picking one? Um, it's all very well for a consultant to tell an employer, I've been in the game for 15 years and I know what I'm doing. But often the employer doesn't know what they need and doesn't know what they want. Um, so this provides a framework by which people can, can at least start to go, okay, well you've met that threshold question, now let's look at your actual experience and your fit for the organisation and those kinds of things. Uh, poor clarity of the generalist role as mentioned. And this is an important one that we get into through the session is poor professional boundaries across the safety profession. So between ergos, hygienists, uh, safety professionals, lawyers, you know, there are a whole bunch of different professions that go, oh, but I'm a safety professional. And we cross over one another. And we all know, you know, the safety professional who goes out and goes, yeah, I can do ergonomics. And we do know the ergon ergonomist who says, oh, yeah, I can manage safety too. And it's, there needs to be a respect around those professional boundaries. Sure, the one person can wear multiple hats, but just because you're one doesn't mean you're the other. So that was some of the issues that started people saying, you know, we do need a process um, by which we can start to certify safety professionals. In, this is an interesting little grab. In 2013, Safe Search did a survey. Only 35 particip participants, which are recruiters, had no difficulty recruiting in the current market. So 65% of recruiters had problems finding competent protect professionals to place in safety roles. So, you know, there was a concern about the general standard of safety professionals in terms, and they use competence. <coughs> it's not even saying, oh, they weren't qualified. They actually just weren't even competent. So it's lifting that game. And in 2004, when Maxwell did the review of the IHS Act in Victoria, he made the recommendation that, and he used the term accreditation, we're using the term certification, but basically said that there would be benefit in looking at a certification process for um, those providing safety advice so that customers can have a level of confidence. So that sort of, um, you know, that confirmed that, you know, this was a process that would be good to go down and WorkSafe in 2007 basically picked up the ball and said, yeah, we need to start this moving. But I will make the point and people have raised an issue along the way of, oh, this is all very Victoria, WorkSafe Victoria driven and all the rest of it. WorkSafe Victoria are not regulating this project in any way. You know, they're not setting down any kind of legislation about it. They actually haven't had anything to do with the development of the certification process. Um, they have actually just provided the money and been a source of advice and support. Um, and they have basically said the profession needs to do it for themselves, of which I'm incredibly proud because I think that we've shown a lot of maturity as a profession to actually go down this path without being coped by legislation forcing us to do this. There are legal obligations on employers to demonstrate due diligence when getting safety advice. They need to be able to show that they have access to sufficient appropriate expertise. That's an international legal principle. Under Australian law, there is a clear obligation for demonstration of due diligence. Um, 
and Safe Work Australia under the Australian strategy, which David alluded to, in um, the it was decided not to mandate um, certification in the model <coughs> legislation, but um, the strategy provides for improved health and safety in infrastructure, in including having access to suitable advice. Um, and, and those providing work health safety having education, training and advice have appropriate capabilities. Okay. So it certainly is a legal requirement whilst there is no regulation that says you must be certified, enshrined within Parliament, it is a legal requirement to be able to demonstrate due diligence. If an employer were to be prosecuted, one of the things they would need to be able to do is say, where did I get my advice? Did I get it from a credible, capable source? Okay. So that in turn provides a real driver for the safety profession to say, well, we need to be that answer. We need to be the people that they say, great, you're the person I'm going to get my advice from because you are um, going to, I'm going to be able to demonstrate due diligence by using someone who is certified. Yeah, so that was the Australian Work Health Safety Strategy. Those providing need to have education, training, advice, have appropriate capabilities. And you'll notice down the bottom, when we were developing some, a logo for the certification process, we looked at it and capable, credible, certified. And capability is a really important term throughout this whole process. It's not just about having the education. It's not just about having the education. It's about having both and it's uh, the experience, and it's about being able to demonstrate that you are capable, okay? So it is an important legal concept uh, within Australia. In 2007, um, the OHS minimum service standards were developed. Now HASPA, we always have, we have too many um, acronyms within safety, but HASPA was the Health and Safety Professionals Alliance, um, and basically that was made up of um, the various professional bodies. So if we have a look here, no, I didn't put it there. Um, it was made up of the ergos, the hygienists, the uh, uh, Safety Institute of Australia, um, and those bodies came together to discuss, um, Safe Work Australia participated, Work Safe, Work Safe Victoria participated around what would be RHS minimum service standards and developed an ethics process for safety professionals. And it was defined that, and if you look at WorkSafe Victoria's definition of suitably qualified, what is a suitably qualified person, which is enshrined in Victorian legislation, people have to have knowledge obtained through education and industry experience. So there's both. They have to be able to demonstrate recent, or recent professional activity. They've got to be able Will to provide referees for the work that they've done. They are a member of a professional association which requires CPD. So you have to be able to demonstrate that you've kept up your knowledge. You know, you've gone and done, uh, and it doesn't mean going and doing courses. It doesn't mean going to a conference. It means developing your professional skill set in a whole range of ways. And one of the things which is a bit of a sidebar is, you know, the SIA is looking at its continuing professional development program to make sure that that's um, really relevant. So when you renew your membership with the SIA, each year you're committing and saying, yes, I've kept up my continuing professional development and I can provide evidence of that if I am asked. And if you look at all of the professional associations, the engineers, the accountants, the lawyers, the doctors, they all have the same thing. Um, you need to be able to demonstrate technical expertise. So. Um, you know, saying I'm going to go and manage a major hazards facility with no experience in that particular field um, might not be such a great idea without supervision. I mean, you might work on something like that with supervision with other people and learn. There's no, no issue with that. We all expand our skills all the time. Um, knowledgeable in contemporary risk management theory. So keeping up to date with what is actually happening and how do we manage risk? Um, it was interesting, I went to a thing earlier this year with Eric Holnagel um, from Denmark and you know I found it absolutely, it's, I, I just, just, it changed my whole way of thinking about a whole bunch of stuff. 
Um, and it's, you know, saying, well, we're not staying perhaps with a more, an older process of, you know, hazard hunting and we're looking now at problem solving and resilience models and all of those kind of things and saying, you actually challenge your thinking and stay up to date with risk management theory. And a big part of it was a commitment to an ethics process. So you basically commit to, to deliver your services and act in a professional manner which is governed by an ethics process. And by doing that, you agree to submit to any kind of ethics process if a complaint were to be made. Okay? So you're being held to account that you, you will deliver services in an ethical way. So that was the minimum service standards which was established. <laughs> and you can see there are a couple of core key elements which have then been picked up in the certification process, which is knowledge obtained through education and experience. So we, that is required under certification. Um, the ability to provide referees for a chartered, uh, certified chartered professional, you need to be able to provide referees. Member of a professional association. Now that's an interesting one, which we'll just talk about uh, a bit later, but you have to have CPD. Um, an ethics process. So. Essentially, the certification process has taken these principles and put them into that process. What does certification achieve? So certification of safety professionals, some of the outcomes and some of the achievements are obviously certainty to customers. So I suppose as a threshold question to say when I'm going to put an ad out for a safety professional, I can say, um, you know, must be certified and at least it gives me a minimum threshold um, you know, comfort that that person has the minimum requirements. Then, um, and then as I said, you can go on and interview them and look at their other skills and so forth, they fit for the organisation. It is a demonstration of due diligence. So I've used someone who is certified by their professional body. Role recognition. So, as I said, I think one of the best things that's come out of that is this makes us or moves us much further towards being a true profession that has its own, um, you know, own role, its own place in the industrial landscape um, and, you know, has the direct channel through to the CEO and the board. It's not just sort of stuck under another um, division or whatever, but there's real role recognition. There is recognition of the professionals have gone out and gotten a bit of education, developed their knowledge and got experience. And I think that's really important. People who you know, work hard in their profession and develop their skills and develop their education should be acknowledged. Um, the, cert the certification process, recognition of practitioner and professional roles. So practitioners are part of certification. Absolutely they are. And it recognises that these are, this is not one and then you, you do this and then you become that. It's saying this is a role in its own right. It has a specialist skill set, a particular skill set, which requires a particular set of knowledge and quite frankly a particular way of thinking. A lot of professionals aren't going to be good practitioners, to be honest, I'm not a good practitioner because I don't have that way of sort of thinking. I'm a different, uh, I think quite differently. So it's really clarifying they are separate and, uh, and independent roles. And also international comparability. In developing the certification process, a lot of work has gone into looking at what are the systems of certification overseas and how are we going to make sure that we have the best chance of portability of certification. So if you're certified in Australia, will that assist you if you want to work overseas? And you know, ultimately that is, that is our aim is for you to be able to go, I'm certified in Australia, and they go, yep, great, good, that means you can work in the UK, Canada, America, the United Emirates, you know, all these other countries. It's not there yet, um, but, you know, it's, it is a goal, and it is one reason why the certification process needs to be to an exceptionally high standard, so that people look at it and go, this is the real deal. You know, this... this um, requires people to be, they are assessed in a very rigorous way, it's open, it's transparent, all of those things. And I think that's, that actually should have a really big tick against it because it's hugely important. So, I've just got a quick question, just in relation to, uh, I think the first point was um, confidence about the, the consumer. Yes. Certainly the consumer. Yep. I 
mean, we're, we're all inside the bubble. We're in the profession. This probably means something to someone in terms of certification yep. in terms of us. Outside of the bubble, the consumer sure. have got a, not got a clue yeah. about yep. certification. I mean, if you talk to them about CPAs, it can. Yes. They'll know about that because yes. it's been advertised. It's you, yep. know, you get the ads from the big uh, consulting firms with how their people have progressed to the CPA field and their yep. you know, Coca-Cola and whatever. Um, what's the strategy for the SIA to, you to, I guess, make certification with the SIA? Mm. And that yeah, and that will be the next step. We need to get it rolled out to our own professionals first, so you guys are on the front foot. You know what's happening. You are able to do what you want to do around certification. And the next step is for us to work with employers, consumers, to make sure they are aware that this is a criteria that they can use when engaging safety professionals. So excellent point, David. Oh, just, just to add to that, that's a really critical part of the medium term overall strategy for certification. As I said in my introduction, there's not much point in having it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I didn't quite say this, but this is what I was getting at. There's, there's, a, there's a few things we have to put into place as a profession to become more credible. This is one of them. Uh, and then we really need to, part of that is getting out and communicating that to all the relevant people. Um, that's going to be a really important part of the process and you know that's you know so I think squarely in uh, my responsibility to make sure we have the right strategy for that just just to say we're very very clear that's one thing developing the program it's another thing uh, getting agreement from industry to apply it and that includes strong communication clear documentation um, and a good and a, and a good you know a good role but it would have been inappropriate to promote it to employers before we had our ducks in a row in yeah, terms yeah, I agree. of professionals. It's just about, is it on your yeah, absolutely, plan? absolutely. So you know there will be, and you know, AI Group, uh, Vecchi, Aki, um, ACTU, they've actually all been involved in the development, and not not so much the technical aspect, but have certainly been the consultation process and stakeholders that have been. Um, involved in the development of the process. So, you know, they're in the tent, um, but absolutely we need to run like the CPA do, you know, the ads that sort of go, if you if you want to have faith in your, C in your accountant, they need to be a CPA. Um, and that is vitally important. I mean, I think it is interesting that, you know, even now we're starting to see ads come out with things like, I saw one that actually had must be a chartered professional member of the SIA. Um, but you know, and so getting it, and recruiters, obviously we, we're very, the recruiters, recruiters are all aware of this. Um, and you know, Safe Search has obviously been a very active member of the SIA for a long time. Um, there are other groups, it's the, the HR group and all of that. So they are being made aware of this process as well and they will be a huge driver. You mentioned before you've got a lot of support from the, the BWA. Yep. Um, how are the other jurisdictions? Yep. Doing that is it, is it seen more as a Victorian thing, or are they no. on board with it sort of from a Dave's program? having a lot of fun integrated, you know, contacting all the regulators and so forth. Look, we actually take a, took a very deliberate decision to say this is not regulator driven, this is not regulator managed. What we are essentially doing is keeping the regulators informed of what's happening. So we didn't go to them and say we want you to support this as such. I mean, obviously they do. There's no doubt because you know it's a legal requirement under the legislation that they regulate that employers show due diligence and get the right advice. So um, you know they certainly are supportive of the principle. But I think it was a really important element of the project um, that we as a profession were doing this. We weren't being driven by the regulators. Do you, do you see a point in time though where each jurisdiction will say we recognise certification under the SIA as being yeah, 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 yeah. Actually, Ross Pilkington's here. I don't look. I, I think the problem with that is, is that regulators. It, it yeah, really but I think it. what regulators do, they're very reluctant to sort of come out and go. We ex we recognise that organisation or that one or that one or that one. What they do is they say we recognise the principle. We 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 say you must demonstrate due diligence when when getting advice, and that means you need to be able to show that there are these things in place. So, I mean, I suppose, yeah, Ross. So, um, within the, 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 the section 
as well, guidance on suitably qualified people. We apply the principles of that. Um, Sue's uh, discussion around certification proves due diligence. Certific certification proves a pillar of due diligence. It doesn't prove it. What it does is it allows you to look at a person and say, okay, you've jumped one hurdle, and there's the hurdle of experience, competency, and, and another of other things that you would consider before they show due diligence. Um, case law uh, in all of the jurisdictions supports the fact that even if you hire somebody who's a professional, you still got to supervise them to make sure they give you what you say you're going to get. And the, the case that comes to mind, and don't ask me to quote it, it's a South Australian case where they hired a boiler inspector, the boiler inspector didn't do the job correctly, and they then prosecuted the employer, not the boiler inspector. Because they didn't show due diligence in the, who they employed and then supervised the task. In, and so that whole concept of I can outsource my risk is gone. Will, we, will you see regulators um, saying that tick, like the health heart tick and things like that? Absolutely not. But we'll show, as Sue says, the general principles of competency, capability, uh, all of that, we would support that. And you'll see that through our strategy. We're uh, signed up to the national strategy, as is every state and jurisdiction in Australia. So you would see that moving forward. So I guess the, if, if uh, Victoria um, has a method of determining whether they're happy with the competency of someone through that process, I guess what I'm looking at is, is it going to be consistent around the country? that everybody applies the same sort of rule up? Oh, look, it's a broad principle. The Section 12 guidance is very broad principle. Uh, and I, and uh, I can't speak for the other jurisdictions, but certainly when we talk to them, they have been advocates for applying similar principles. Uh, we can't even agree. Can't say that. So, uh, <laughs> They're on camera. <laughs> so uh, we, we have the broad principles of OHS legislation enshrined both in Victoria and every other jurisdiction in Australia and applying those principles should be seen to be a positive. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's right. I mean, it's an element of due diligence. I mean, the reality is, it's a bit like the ATO is never going to say you have to use a CPA. You know, I mean, some employers are quite capable of managing their own safety without a safety professional for whatever reason. Because they recognise a CPA in any of their... No, no, no. Because I might be quite capable of doing my own tax and quite frankly, with the accountants I've had, I think I am. You know, uh, so it's exactly the same principle. They're basically saying you need to get capable, credible advice. Um, we're not going to mandate that you have to employ someone to do that, but you've got to demonstrate it, it's, that it's capable and credible and that you've supervised. So one of the ways of ticking that box around capable, capable and credibility is to say, well, I'm going to use somebody who's certified because the certification process makes them jump the hoops to prove yeah. capability. Is it in the yep. UK that they actually register safety professionals, I think? They have, the UK has, sorry Kevin, I'll come to you in a sec. So can you, can you repeat the question so people in the back can hear? Okay, sorry. Um, the question was, does the UK register? register they safety. certainly have a certification process, um, which is <coughs> a bit later on, but yeah, they have a certification <coughs> process, so it's exactly the same. So when you say register, I mean, it's the same thing. I think I heard somewhere that they actually registered safety professionals. So I'm not sure that Well, they certify right. them, which is the same process. Yeah. Sorry, Kevin? Um, I've got to remember the question now. Oh. Um, no, I'll pass. OK, I'll pass. sorry. I'll wait till later. Sure. Hand up down the back. Yeah, I'm from the UK. Yep. Do you want to stand up and then? I'm a child safety. Yep. Uh, graduated in 1999, um, part of the Institute of Occupational Safety and Health yep. in the UK. Um, I was quite new to, you know, Australia as a as a regulatory domain, etc. So this is a very interesting subject for me. But I want to know if you've got a working definition uh, yes. of certification. Is, is that available? Yes, in here. Well. When you say we've got a working definition, when you say it's a working definition of certification, what do you mean? Well, when you say um, the word certified, I've also heard you say the expression certified chartered. So yeah. what's the difference? Between yeah, yeah. We've got categories of certifi certification and we'll look at that a little bit further down. Yeah? Okay. So uh, can I, uh, following on from that, there's a lot of C words here. Yes. <clears throat> and there's other C words that come up as well. An important one is competence, um, um, and yes, I'm just interested whether 
capability, credibility, certification is competence because that's what we expect from all the other trained people that we have on our work sites. We expect them to be competent. Mm -hmm. So can you, can you address yes. this competency? Yeah, context it's a good point because that actually was a, quite a discussion about should we use the word competence, should we use the word capability, and there was actually quite significant pushback on using competence. Um, because capability is a much more encompassing term in terms of um, you are you know, capable to provide advice by, through your experience, through your education, through all of those things. So there was a deliberate decision not to use the term competence. Um, so, and that's why we came up with the capable, credi credible, certified. Well, just a combination of those three. Well, competency is a part of capability. Yeah. You're demonstrating your competence. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So I was just wondering, can we perhaps, while through the presentation, yeah. people save their questions? To the yeah, end? I just thought I'd right. just let a few, because we've sort of... This slide for about 20 minutes. No, that's all right, but the questions have sort of um, pertained to other areas within the section. So, look, so basically that was just a bit of a summary of around what some of the drivers are for certification, why we've gone down this path. Um, you know, and, and, and it is, as I said, it's based on fact, you know, feedback from employers, feedback from regulators, um, and also a recognition of the legal requirements.